Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Podcast. This audio is brought to you by Canon Press. Before we get started, this is your reminder that if you've been living under a rock, now is the time to rise and get Ride Sally Ride from Douglas Wilson. It's really important that you go out and get Ride Sally Ride before it is no longer satire. Get it at ridesallybook.com. Welcome to the podcast. This is episode 164. Good to be with you again. Thank you for joining me again. Hope we have a good time, right? I'm going to have a good time. I don't know about you. The thing I want to talk about is uh, this year, 2020, that we're in. Uh, we are coming to the end of it. And uh, I, I'd like to set out a principle for God's people to think about it as we look at what a tumultuous year it has been. I've seen a lot of memes, a lot of Facebook jokes, a lot of uh, references to what a, you know, what a year. Well, it says in Hebrews that when God shakes things, he does this so that what cannot be shaken may remain. And, and he goes on to say that we Christians are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So our kingdom cannot be shaken. The church has been established by God. The church is not going anywhere. The church is never going to be eradicated. The church is going to be forever. In fact, out of the three governments that, that God has established among men, civil government and family government and the government of the church, only the church is going to be forever. The bride of Christ is forever. Uh, marriage will cease. It'll be whatever we have. It'll be better than marriage, better than marriage and better than what we have here. But marriage and family as we know it, is going to be gone. Geopolitics, as we know it, the, the kings of the earth will bring their glory and honor into the new Jerusalem. So I think there will still be some sort of national identity, but we won't have the same political uh, system anymore. But the church, Christ has taken a bride, and he is going to have that bride forever. So why does God do this sort of thing? Well, it says in Hebrews that God shakes us up. A lot of things that we thought were certain and secure and stable apparently evaporated overnight. So in a recent sermon, I said it's as though God took the year and he threw it into a KitchenAid, you know, you know, one of those bread mixer bowls. And our whole existence is chugga 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 going away there on the counter. And we think this is terrible. We think this is awful. What is God doing? And God says something like, I'm making bread. He's doing something. God specializes in doing marvelous things in ways that we would not volunteer to have done. Think of it another way. I'll use a minor illustration. If you have a kid who comes crying, comes in from outside, he fell off his bike in the driveway, and he comes in with um, a good portion of the driveway in his knee, and his mom says, oh, you poor baby, and let me get, let me get a hot washcloth. I'll wash that out. And the boy quickly volunteers, I'll do it, I'll do it, you know, I'll, let, me, let me go wash it out. Well, the reason he wants to wash it out is he knows that he could be safely trusted to dab around the edges, as Jeremiah puts it, to who heal the wound lightly. Uh, his mom is going to clean it out, and it's going to hurt like crazy, and then she's going to spray something on it, and then she's going to put a bandage on it, and there's going to be some, th there will be some exquisite moments in there. Well. That's why the boy wants to do it himself. We want reformation, right? We, we Christians have been praying for reformation for a long time. We, we pray for reformation and revival all the time. Be, why? Why do we want reformation? Because America has got a lot of gravel in its knee. America has got this thing that has to be attended to. And so we pray for reformation, we, which is in the analogy, us running in, uh, asking mom to have a look at it. And so she says, oh, let me do that. Uh, let me take care of that for you. And we say, no, no, <laughs> no. Uh, well, so what's happened, what 2020 is, is God sitting us down and saying, look, we have to scrub that out. We have to, we have to deal with that. And it's not pleasant. It's not comfortable. But there are, there are many things that God is doing for us in the space of just a few months. 
that we would not have gotten around to for 25 years. We, we wouldn't have gotten to that particular difficulty. We would, have, we would not have pulled the plug on certain things. I look at the secularists, I think of Old Testament battles where uh, the Israelites go out to war and all of a sudden the enemy starts, they start fighting one another. And you say, what? Well, you know, what? So one of the, uh, there are multiple examples of this with COVID cases, with the reactions to it, the lockdowns, the masking orders, the economic damage, the relocations, the massive refugee columns that are forming as people are getting the heck out of California or out of Oregon or out of Illinois or out of New York. Uh, There are some places that may never bounce back, or if they bounce back, they won't be the same. And if I had said, uh, God, would you please greatly diminish the cultural authority that New York City has? Well, we sometimes ask God to do things, and we have no idea of what the price would be, how much it would cost, or the impact it would have if God were to actually do it. Or if we said, if we recognize that one of the places where the toxic poisons are being pumped into the American circulatory system, it's from our system of higher education. It's from our, our state universities and, and uh, the secular private universities. And what's happening is these universities are putting their very existence at risk. What is happening? Well, God's shaking us down. And, and Christians ought to be thinking that when God does this kind of shakedown, he does it so that that which cannot be shaken may remain. And that means all the churches, all the churches that have submitted to the lockdown shutdown orders, many of which are not going to come back, are churches that ought not to have come back. In other words, their lampstand is removed. And what that's going to leave is fewer churches but more dedicated, more vibrant, more aggressive, more eager to preach the gospel, and so on. So, this has been a rough year. This has been a rough year. And I don't want to belittle the fact that there are many Christians who may have lost jobs or may have been affected by this, affected by COVID directly or indirectly. Uh, That's very true. But God is in his heaven. God is in control. And he's got good purposes for us. Continuing with podcast episode 164, normally in this hamartiology course of ours, we talk about sins that are abstract nouns, so anger or lust or whatever. Uh, But now we come to something more personal, but which we can't actually skip over. Uh, That word is bilzibul, bilzibul. It comes in as a slander against the Lord, wherein he, the Lord Jesus, is accused of being the master of that demonic house, right? So, uh, the master of that demonic house. The name arises first. Where does this name come first in Scripture? Well, the name arises first in Scripture, where Beelzebub is the god of Ekron, the Philistine city. So, Beelzebub, the, uh, the Baal, for the beginning is Baal, obviously Lord. Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, the Philistine city. King Ahaziah sends a messenger to consult with that god instead of inquiring with Yahweh. We see that in 2 Kings 1, 1 through 6, and verse 16. And the name Beelzebub, Beelzebub means Lord of the Flies, Lord of the Flies. Now, it's possible that this was a mocking alteration of the Canaanite Beelzebul, Beelzebul, meaning Lord of the High Place. So, Beelzebul is Lord of the High Place, and it's quite possible that the Israelites tinkered with it, turned it into Beelzebub, meaning Lord of the Flies. But what does it mean by the time by the time we get to the New Testament? What does it mean? So the first uh, passage is from Matthew ten. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? So Jesus is saying, if they called the Lord Beelzebub, uh, with how much more contempt are they going to treat his servants? Then there was another occasion where the scribes and Pharisees accused Jesus of casting out devils through a devilish power. This happens in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Notice in these places that Beelzebub is identified as the prince of all devils. 
Beelzebub is the prince of all devils. Just keep, keep your ears tuned for that. Matthew 12, 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. So Beelzebub is the prince of the devils. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and by that prince of the devils casteth he out devils. That's from Mark 3.22. But some of them said, He casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. Luke 11.15. So, prince of the devils, prince of the devils, chief of the devils. Now we see in the Lord's response to all of this, that he, he, regard, he identifies this figure with Satan, who is the prince of all devils. Uh, devils, which is what Paul tells us in, uh, in Ephesians, where the devil is the prince of the power of the air. So Jesus says in Luke eleven eighteen, if Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because ye say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. So Jesus is uh, using Satan and Beelzebub interchangeably. If I'm casting out devils through Beelzebub, then Satan is divided against himself. The Lord also points out that if his exorcisms are demonic, then what does that do to all the other exorcisms that are being done? So in Luke eleven nineteen, and if and if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. And then also in Matthew twelve twenty seven, and if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges something very close. So, uh, we see that Beelzebub uh, is the god of the Philistine city of Ekron, which incidentally tells you since Satan is a real figure, he's not a figment of imagination. He's not, somebody, he's not a spook that somebody invented. Not, he's not a superstition. Since he begins, uh, he apparently begins his um, time in the New Testament as the god of Ekron, excuse me, his time in the Bible, as the god of Ekron. Now, we, we can piece together a few things from the New Testament where in 1 John we're told that Satan, uh, the, excuse me, the devil was a murderer uh, from the beginning. And in Romans 16, Paul takes the, the promise that um, uh, the, in Genesis 3.15, that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. Uh, Paul takes that and applies it to Satan. The God, of, uh, the God of peace will soon crush Satan beneath your feet. And then uh, in Revelation, the devil is called that ancient serpent. So basically, we have good reason for tracing Satan or Beelzebub back to the garden, but he also makes a brief appearance as the God of Ekron, and then he's identified in the New Testament with. Satan. Continuing with podcast episode 164, we come now to my book review, and my book review is uh, of a book called Cheap Sex by Regnerus, R-E-G-N-E-R-U-S, Regnerus, Cheap Sex. This book is a sociological study, many interviews, evaluation of numerous surveys, comparison and whatnot. And one of the things that honest social scientists do is they frequently will study something and study it exhaustively and come up with a conclusion that your great-grandmother could have told you. And I, I'm not giving the back of my hand to this book. It was quite a good book. But what it boils, what it boils down to is that, that when promiscuity becomes the norm, Promiscuity becomes the norm. You have a situation develop that makes relationships very, very difficult. When you have a tight laced society with regard to sex and sexuality, and there's only one socially respectable way for a man to have access to sex, and that's by finding a woman he wants to be with and marry her and care for her and care for her children. What happens is civilizations develop. As I, I said one time, I, I forget where I said it, but civilizations are built by men with families to feed. Civilizations are built by men with families to feed. If women uh, start giving, what, what this uh, fellow does, Regnerus does, is he 
examines in detail the different attitudes that men and women have toward sex and sexual activity, the different attitudes that they have toward uh, free love, the different attitudes that they have toward um, sex that's available anytime, anytime, anywhere. And what, what this does is, one of the things you have, we have to be careful about is one of the arguments that strict feminists have made for years is that marriage, traditional marriage, is simply a glorified form of prostitution because uh, sex and money are at the heart of it. So, because a man promises to take care of a woman for life, and because in exchange they get married in church and they go have sex that night, it's simply prostitution. It's a financial transaction. But the reason prostitution is grotesque is not because of what, they, what prostitution includes. Prostitution is not an evil because it includes the transactional elements of money and sex. The problem is that they have, it's a truncated view. It's, the problem is created by what they leave out. So the issue is not, the issue is not so much that money and sex are included. The issue is what is left out. What is left out are the curtains and mowing the lawn and going to the kids' uh, baseball game and staying faithful to mom and uh, getting the kids through college. You know, it's, it's life, basically. Uh, so money and sex are certainly involved and certainly right, uh, are central to the whole thing. But there's love and friendship and companionship and uh, commitment and that sort of thing. And when you strip all those other things away, and the only thing you have is the financial payment and the, and the sexual act, then you have something that is a caricature, a, a cartoon of what marriage is. So rather than say that marriage is a glorified form of prostitution, it would be better to say that prostitution is a demented cartoon of marriage. Okay, so when you have two things that resemble one another in any way, you want to say, well, which is the copy of which? Is marriage a cleaned up version of prostitution or is prostitution a degraded form of marriage? So with that said, what Regneris does is he examines the data and shows that in the sexual marketplace, what the sexual revolution has done is crashed the negotiating power of women. It's ba basically what, what you're doing is here's the comparison of Christians who, are, who labor at building a private school system, or you want to establish a private school, build a private school, and you're doing it when the government school system down the street is giving away the same product for free. So uh, now, it's not really free, and it's a slipshod product, but what you're doing is you've got these upright, chaste, godly Christian women who are uh, reserving themselves for marriage. And they're doing it in a world where modesty standards have collapsed, where pornography is ubiquitous and rampant, where in many cities, in many places, uh, if a guy asks a girl out, sex by the second date is simply expected. And you have that, ki that's kind of the vibe, that's kind of the thing that everybody is assuming. What you have done is destroyed, just absolutely uh, knocked the bottom out of a good and gracious, godly woman's means of protecting and, and uh, guarding herself. And that's, that's one of the reasons why you're having such trouble with, uh, when, when I got married, uh, 1975, I got married right around the average time. I got married when I was 22, I think. My wife was 23, I was 22, I think that's right. And uh, the average age for marrying in that year was right, you know, I was right in the pack. We were, we were doing what everybody else was doing. And now the, uh, the average age for marrying is right around 29. So people are postponing marriage. They're reducing the number of kids they have. They are, uh, or not marrying at all. And this is all, I would argue, the direct result of the sexual revolution. So if you want to, um, read some heartbreaking stories and see some hard evidence for the reality of this, I recommend Cheap Sex by Regneris. Mm -hmm.